All right, welcome everyone. I'm Benjamin, I'm the head of program here at Slush. Honored to be moderating this panel with you all. So the context to why we're here today is that the Nordics produce a disproportionate amount of exceptional tech companies. And this is not just by luck. Um, there really is something special about how we approach company building out here. And today we have with us uh, three iconic leaders from the Nordics. We have Sofia, Ilka and Josefine, uh, former and current leaders from companies such as Swadify, Supercell and Crew, which are all defining Nordic companies that have really collectively raised the ambition level of what's possible in this neck of the woods. Uh, what makes these three companies so special is not only their success, uh, but that they characterize three waves of Nordic companies. Spotify founded in 2006, Supercell in 2010, and Crew in 2014, all neatly four years apart from each other. But today, we're here to discuss Nordic leadership, the supposed secret sauce for why these Nordic countries produce so many successful startups. Um, so to kick things off, I'd like to take us back 10 years to 2012. So to set the scene, Supercell had just released their first to-be hits, Heyday and Clash of Clans. Spotify had just pierced the US market, reaching one million paying customers, and Crew itself uh, was not founded yet. Uh, and Josephine was building Glossy Box. And if you think about the venue we're here today, uh, Slush was 3,000 people at the cable factory on the other side of town. So what was it about this time uh, 10 years ago that set us on this trajectory to produce over 15 unicorns in these 10 years? What was the spark? Maybe, Sophia, if you want to take the lead. <laughs> yeah, sure. Happy to, to give it a go. I think uh, at least my experience with Spotify in the early days, we didn't really have a proper ecosystem in Stockholm. Uh, at the time, there were no co-working hubs, no accelerators, no kind of known angels that you could go to. Um, so I think we really kind of figured our way out. But as we went along, I think we um, also saw the ecosystem grow. Mm -hmm. So I think from that time comparing to now, we have such a mature ecosystem. There's a lot of talent, access to talent, access to money, I think in all different stages. So I think you see both more angel investors, pre-seed and seed investors, and also late stage investors. And I love to see how kind of former operators often invest in new companies, because then we recycle both sort of knowledge, experience, capital, but also network. It's so much easier to you know, have a, a, a good conversation with someone if you come sort of recommended by someone else that have already worked yep. with that person. So I think sort of the, the ecosystem have matured. And I think you know, this event, once a year, coming here to meet people from across the globe has definitely helped catapult it and sort of speed up the process in getting the ecosystem to be mature. Exactly. And then I think there are a few kind of more macroeconomic things that have helped at least Sweden to be a good place to start a company. I think kind of early adopter and access to internet, of course, one. Mm -hmm. And then that we have a lot of good data and statistics, and I think that can also help. And I also think that we have a good um, sort of social security uh, setup, which makes that you know it's easier for us to think about bigger problems than just sort of paycheck to paycheck thinking. Yeah. And I think that in one of the um, state of the European tech reports, it was stated that the Nordic region has the most uh, mission-led founders. Mm -hmm in Europe, and I think that holds true. Definitely. What about Ilka and Josefine? What was it about 2012? <laughs> 2012, like, you know, what I remember from those days is that I think suddenly there was this like a, a much higher level of ambition like mm. with the founders. You know, like um, I think in the early 2000s then I got started with entrepreneurship and, and tech entrepreneurship, you know, companies from Finland would talk about, OK, we're going to go global, but we're going to take it easy. So first you prove your service in Finland, and then you go to Holland, and then you go to Sweden, and maybe Norway, and Denmark, and then slowly you move to the rest of Europe. And all of a sudden, you had these companies who say that, no, you know, we're going to be the number one globally, <laughs> and, and from a get-go. And, and there was a much, much higher level of ambition. And, and then the other thing was that, you know, of course, I myself had been very inspired by companies like, you know, there were very few 
successes like with MySQL or, or say uh, Skype uh, mm -hmm. coming coming from Sweden. But all of a sudden there were like others who were trying to do the same thing. Like of mm -hmm. course they're super inspired by uh, you know what uh, Sophia and, and Daniel were doing with Spotify, and there was of course Rovio here in Finland and others. And I, I felt that you know we were as a group we were kind of uh, were inspired by each other, and everybody was sort of raising the bar like yeah. for everybody else. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, same. I was also going to talk about the ambition and like, because uh, I think I, I've had the questions many times, like how, how did we set, sort of set the bars for Kri and what did we think we could achieve? And um, so I spent a lot of time with Daniel and Martin just sort of when they were dreaming about Spotify and talking about the incredible talent they were hiring. So like Sophia being one of them before we knew each other. And then also um, like the Klarna guys were in my class. Uh, Eric Walfosch was in my class who founded SoundCloud. And it just became, you know, like when your peers are building global companies, then it doesn't become like a, an impossible thing to do. It seems like a quite viable thing to do. So I think that whole sort of perspective change is so important. And you think, well, if that person can do it, maybe I can. And mm -hmm. I think that's really been growing the ecosystem since with all these uh, successes coming from such a small sort of place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So while there really is strength to these smaller ecosystems, maybe moving into the leadership aspect of this, um, what are the Nordic leadership traits that really separate startups from those building Silicon Valley, for example? Uh, what has been our advantage in that sense in building these companies and especially leading them like you have? Maybe Sophia, if you want to start again. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can only speak from my experience, but I think we have had a very kind of flat organization, mm -hmm. at least uh, at my years at Spotify. And we also wanted to always hire people that were better than ourselves. And if you do that, uh, and you give them a lot of autonomy and a lot of trust, then you can scale a company properly. Mm -hmm. If you wouldn't, and if you would try and micromanage people and don't trust them, you're going to slow down and you're not going to succeed. So I think we had a very open culture. Daniel was so good at always saying, like, the door is always open. You can come to me in our town halls. You could ask any question. So I think a very open and transparent culture uh, set the bar fairly high. So we felt empowered and we felt inspired and sort of leading more because we were supercharged on being on this mission together rather than, you know, feeling that we were working nine to five just because it's a, it's a job. We were more kind of on fire and having fun together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Does this resonate with you, Ilka and Josefin, in terms of Nordic leadership traits? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this kind of open spirit and that collaboration that is kind of part of the society, actually. And I think at least maybe 10 years ago, people used to be upset there were high taxes in Sweden and all these other things, right? But then it's like Sophia said, it also means that there's social welfare, so you can try things. Mm -hmm. Very well-educated population, infrastructure that allows for things to happen. You can hire a very skilled work workforce. And, and I think what's really changed um, since 2006, when I started in the startup community in Stockholm, is that you don't only have the skills coming from um, schools, right, coming out, but it's also all the uh, incredibly skilled people working in all these uh, startups, and then you really have the ecosystem. It's not just the angels or the other factors, it's really the skills and mm -hmm. yeah. knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with both Josephine and, and Sophia, but maybe just put an additional spotlight on this uh, idea of trust. You know, I, I think mm. that's sort of built in in, you know, in the Nordic societies. I mean, and you know, people just trust each other. They even trust the government. And you know, and you know, for us, it's it's a given, but it isn't a given in mm -hmm. in, in that many other countries. And you've all, you know, there's this this classical test that you leave your wallet somewhere, and what's the probability that you will get it back? Mm -hmm and nothing stolen, and that's extremely high, at least in, in, in Finland, and I'm sure it's the same in, in Sweden. And you know, that, that sort of built-in trust that we have in the society, like also is uh, uh, reflected in companies. And then you actually trust the people you work with, it means that you don't need mm. to kind of micromanage them, and there's less control, people feel better, you know, and, and teams and people, they execute much, much faster, because they don't need to get an approval for every single thing, and it yeah. leads to higher quality work. So trust is, if I would have to pick one thing, it would be trust. Okay. I agree. And also like psychological safety so that you can speak up and that no questions are weird or stupid questions. And if you have that in your culture, I think you have a really good foundation. 
Yeah, definitely. I think maybe Ilka, like following up on this, your first company, Sumea, was acquired by Digital Chocolate, which was an American a game studio in 2004. Um, so you've experienced Silicon Valley firsthand uh, working for Digital Chocolate post acquisition. Um, so maybe starting with you as well, what are some leadership principles from the US uh, that startups from the Nordic should take note of um, based on your experience there? I know, Sofia, you've also worked in the US, but let's start with you, Ilka. Well, I, I think I, I would almost go back to what I already said. It's this kind of level of, of ambition. Mm -hmm. like especially like in the early days of my career, I I've felt that you know, we just weren't being ambitious enough. And, and you know, us Finns, you know, we are like oftentimes we can confuse these things that, you know, I mean, we are all humble, but that shouldn't be confused with this fact that, I mean, of course, you can still be like very, very ambitious, yet being, mm -hmm. being humble. And, and, you know, I think those can actually go, go hand in hand. And I, I think it's such an important thing, you know, and I, I you know, and I, I think there's still maybe some things that you can learn from our, say, American friends on that, how kind of a, how like crazy ambitious how they are and, and can be. And, you know, they can uh, dream like really, really big. And, and they're like it's, and they're it's very natural for them to like talk about it in public, and you know, and and it's it's a very natural thing to do. Where I think you know, I, and I, and by the way, I, I should say that you know the, the the current generation of this new generation of entrepreneurs is like so much better at this, you know. Uh, and I know I actually I'm not sure if we even have that problem anymore. Uh, I'm pretty sure we don't. But you know, if I remember the old days, I think that was the one thing that I learned and took to heart. Mm -hmm. Sophia, do you have any, any learnings from your time at Spotify in New York as well? <laughs> yes, I have uh, one thing. A friend of mine, American, one of the first hires in the Spotify marketing team in New York, she uh, really appreciated the Nordic leadership style that we implemented there. But we also saw this a bit of the lack of, uh, you know, when telling the story, to be bold enough. Mm -hmm. We were so humble, so sometimes people underestimated us. <laughs> And she and I used to say that a love child between you know, the US and the Nordics would be the perfect mix because we would deliver on you know, the Nordic standards, yeah. but we would also be really good at communicating and telling the story uh, you know, in a very natural, speedy, precise way. Exactly. I think next up, it would be good to think about um, like today, where we are today, what the founders of, the, of today are in the Nordics. And you sort of alluded to this already, but um, is there something different about uh, the Nordic leaders and the Nordic founders of today compared to 10 years ago that's um, very important for you? You mentioned ambition, for example. I know you're all uh, investors as well. Um, is there something that um, really separates the current generation? Maybe Josephine, if you want to start with this one. Well, for starters, I think they're more diverse, which I'm very passionate about. That it's not uh, only men, to put it that way, <laughs> or almost only men. Uh, so more diverse, like in my angel portfolio, there are plenty of women. And I think the sort of impact driven or I mean, it feels like it's old news by now, but it's uh, I think all of us want uh, the new generation to build companies that really make a difference. Right. And I think that's uh, a huge difference to 10 years ago mm -hmm. um, and very compelling and fun and also where the big, uh, you know, the really uh, big things you can do with big, uh, the, I love the quote that um, Martin usually uh, tells that, you know, the more challenges you've overcome, the higher the valuation of your company. So I think that rings true for a lot of people and that's why we should pick big challenges and try to solve them, right? So <laughs> I think there's a big difference in that. Fantastic. What about the two of you? Uh, how do the founders of today seem to you? <laughs> yeah, I think they're more mission-driven, to your point. I think the, uh, the young generation are much more and painfully aware of the problem we're facing. And to, to that point, I think we have the greatest challenges in our generation you know, right now. So there's a fantastic time to start a company and tackle those. I think we all feel like we need to be able to kind of look you know, our kids in the eyes and say, this is what I worked on in order to make it better. So I definitely see like a, a bigger portion being mission driven. And then I also think it's a bit more global than before. So like a Y Combinator, for instance, is something that a lot of people have access to now. Knowledge sharing, like yes, the sessions that you guys record here or that YC is sort of giving out for free. I think there's so much content. So if you're a very ambitious founder, you can seek information and get access super easy. Yeah. So I would say that they are more kind of 
maybe more ambitious, more kind of uh, impact driven, and also a bit more um, global from start, probably. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think the current generation, they, what they want to make is they want to make global impact. And then not only that, but I think they're also like better, like for example, my generation was ever at like telling it as a story, like better storytellers. Yeah. And you know, in a very like simple way, they can like explain what they're about to do and why it's going to happen in a very inspiring way. And I think there's, I think it's been a tremendous amount of improvement. I think if I look at the entrepreneurs of today, and I'm, I, I personally get extremely inspired when I look at the, the next generation of entrepreneurs that's going to come out from places like Slush. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I'd like to move to a bit more of a practical note now. Um, so I think Sonali Deruka from Axel, one of the sort of most legendary VCs in Europe, uh, she's actually invested in all Spotify, Supercell, and Crew. Um, she's spoken a lot about how Nordic leaders strive to have almost as little power as possible uh, when, when they lead companies. It would be interesting to hear, maybe starting with you, Ilka, uh, what does this sort of practically mean uh, for founders who might want to implement this sort of culture into their companies as well? Yeah, you know, um, and Sonali and I have actually spoke about this a lot, but I, I think it comes down to like to a few things. You know, first of all, you need to kind of hire the best possible people, and then you need to be able to somehow put the right group of people together to form like the best possible teams. <laughs> and then, in addition to that, you have to like somehow create a culture where these teams can have the biggest possible impact. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it, when it comes down to like you know, Sofia mentioned psychological safety in the team, but also in the greater company. You know, people must be um, it must be comp uh, they must be encouraged to take risks. <laughs> and then you know, for example, at Supercell, like we created this culture um, that you know whenever we fail or for example kill a game we always celebrate that thing with you know with champagne because and, and the thing <laughs> is that you know we really want to make it completely safe and actually like okay to fail and and you know we just fundamentally believe that companies you know they don't uh, fail because they take risks you know they fail because they stop taking risks mm -hmm. so those are the things that are close to my my heart <laughs> yeah does this resonate with you, Sofia and Josephine? Is this a, a Nordic trait to strive for as little power as possible, so to say? Yeah, I think maybe we come across as understated, at least uh, abroad. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that, at least my experience is that we can have a lot of sort of power, but we are also confident enough to give others power. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that's how you make a company grow. And I think you, you want to strive to create this culture that Ilka describes, because then you make something and you make people feel like they're part of something that is greater than themselves. And I think that's when you get the real momentum and the real excitement and the real uh, journey, so to speak. Um, and sometimes some of the American leaders that I have be been working with, they have had bigger egos and it's been more about them and their journey and their career mm -hmm. and trying to control. Mm -hmm. I think if you turn it around and you try and make people grow yeah. and you take a few steps back, I think that's the more exciting part. Mm -hmm. And I think as a leader, it's the most rewarding thing ever to see people flourish and grow. When you have created that you know, circumstances so they can grow and, and yeah. excel and do more than they ever thought they were able to. Mm -hmm. I think that's like the goosebump moment uh, yeah. in the journey. <laughs> I, I love that. Fantastic. Yeah, I think sometimes we, uh, it's such a big part of startup culture, right, to hire talent, 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 talent. Everyone talks about talent all the time. But then maybe there's a second, second piece with the puzzle, which is really enabling all those people to really harness their talents to achieve their goal. And that's uh, not easy, right? So it's uh, fun, it's challenging, and it really makes you grow also, I think, as a leader. Mm -hmm. So maybe there will be more conversations on that, on those topics too, rather than, because I think everyone needs, by now knows, <laughs> hire very talented people. But it's uh, the second part, it's very fun, huh? Mm -hmm. No, oh, that's super interesting. And I think sort of while, as we've just heard, there's a lot of praise for Nordic leadership and we have a lot of these success stories to back it as well. Uh, but it'd be interesting to hear what are the things that we could still do better? Uh, so, so where do we go from here how, and how do we keep growing uh, that if there isn't this sort of plateau? What should we change? Maybe, Sophia, you look like you want to answer. Yeah, no, happy to start. I think from a... Um society level, I think it's important to make it easy for tech companies to recruit 
hire talent from abroad. Mm -hmm. And in Sweden, we have had some difficulties with visa processes that have been painful and long and hard, and it's just been a bit of a mess. Mm -hmm. Same, I think, with option programs, that I think they should be kind of developed in a way that uh, makes it easy for founders to share the company. Mm -hmm. um, and then, sorry, remind me of the question again, how we can create better. Yeah, I think it's just about how there are these, there's this sort of narrative of Nordic leaders and this sort of special Nordic culture, but something must be missing. I'm sure something can be done better. better uh, yeah. So what are the things, for example, founders themselves could practice yeah. uh, going forwards that they might still be lacking generally in the Nordic mm. ecosystem and culture? Yeah, so those are maybe a bit more technical, but I think mm. in the future, I, I think, you know, role models are really important. Mm -hmm. And uh, to Josephine's points about diversity, I would love to see more kind of female founders that reach kind of unicorn or IPO levels so that we have more diverse set of uh, unicorn founders. <laughs> I think it's, it's a massive uh, role to play there because I think we inspire each other so much. Um, then I think education uh, and also the fact that kind of starting early and having kind of entrepreneur classes or kind of dorm room funds even to start angel investing when you're in school. I think that's also a great example of how we can help boost and foster the, the community even earlier in our own journeys. Mm -hmm. And then I think celebrate success <laughs> and also celebrate the failures and celebrate the people yeah. that actually dare to go up in the ring and do it. Mm -hmm. Because we, we talk a lot about it, but actually building a company like Supercell or Cree or Spotify, it takes, you know, full focus and, and blood, sweat and tears. So I yes. think cel celebrate the people that have done it is also an important part. Mm -hmm. Well, thankfully, that's what we're all here to do. Um, I think sort of um, it would be interesting to hear that, especially if Ilka, you've been on the slush stage for quite a while, and uh, you actually said in 2015 on the slush stage that the next Google could be born out of the Nordics. Um, so it, was, it would be interesting to hear, what's your dream for the Nordic ecosystem? Obviously, we've spoken about this sort of growth over the past 10 years, but if you look into the future of like 2030, uh, how would you like the Nordic ecosystems to look like? What is the sort of success story? that you would like to be defined by here? Well, I still have the same dream and, and still absolutely believe it, it, it can and it will happen. Mm -hmm. question is when. <laughs> um, well, I, I guess the ultimate dream, of course, you know, that those type of companies would be born from our ecosystem. Uh, and, you know, like, um, and for the longest time, like the, from the Nordics have went to Silicon Valley to, like, you know, get advice and see how things are done. You know, I'd love there to be a, a time uh, there they actually come here and see like, okay, like, wow, like, what are these people in these Nordic countries doing right? Uh, and and I, I think, you know, that's already like starting to happen, by the way. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. What about Josephine? Where do we go from here? Well, I'm still an operator, right? So I'm <laughs> all, my head is full of all the things that I'm going to do with my company and my, but, and things I wish for, for my angel company, uh, um, like my sort of my portfolio. But yeah, I hope that we can build great impact driven companies and um, many more unicorns that really makes a difference. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, maybe on this question, uh, Sophia, for example, you mentioned, um, like legislation around option pools and immigration, for example, do you think our biggest challenges are on this side of the table or more in the sort of startup culture and how do we actually build companies? Uh, or sort of what's the biggest bottleneck that prevents from the next Google to be from the Nordics? You mean how we can keep them in the Nordics rather than having losing them to the outside or sorry? No, you... how we can build a company like that from the Nordics. So what yeah. are the biggest challenges for that still? Now, I think, you know, we have so many things that are um, where the stars are aligned right now. There are so many solutions off the shelf that you can work with that didn't exist when we started Spotify. And then I think, you know, we, if we improve on these things, the sort of talent visa and option programs, mm -hmm. I think that's a really good starting point. And then I would just love to see more people that have the opportunity to invest uh, to do so. So yeah. continue sort of the angels in reinvesting in the ecosystem and to see sort of operators and founders to share their knowledge back into the ecosystem. So we reinvest our money and time. And then I think my dream for the future would be to see more female founders and so see the next Google, but maybe within an impact vertical coming from the Nordic region and to have the US to come here <laughs> rather than the other way around. 
Exactly. Um, we have a couple of minutes left, and I think it would be nice to end on a note that, for example, especially the founders and aspiring founders in the audience could take home. Um, so what's the most important non-negotiable you've stuck by in your leadership? What is the sort of one rule that you try to stick by throughout your career? Uh, so maybe if we want to start with Josefine and make our way down here. <laughs> yeah, I think it's <clears throat> very um, important for me. Uh, it's not the best word, but it's called a no bullshit policy. So uh, I like transparency, directness, uh, bringing up problems when you have them, trying to be fair to everyone you can, trying to act sustainable. So sort of that's very core to me and something that I try to operate by all the time. Um, yeah, no bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, it would be trust. I mean, if I think about Supercell, like I, I, we, have, we have very sort of few processes and, and, and those type of things. You know, you know, we, we, we like to say that you know we're kind of replacing the traditional control mechanisms with this very thing, very simple thing called trust. And you know, that without trust, at least our organization just simply can't work. I mean, it just won't work. It, it's sort of a foundation that we build everything on top of. So that's the non-negotiable from my side. Fantastic. And for me, it would be to have fun. If I don't have fun, I'm bad at it, and I should be somewhere else. So as long as I'm having fun, then I think I'll do a good job. Same for my team members. <laughs> Fantastic. I think there are a lot of uh, important lessons for the founders and the audience to take forward. And uh, thank you so much for, for sharing your, your pulse on the Nordic ecosystem. And I think it will be interesting in, say, 10 years, if we were referring back to 2012, we can look back in 2032 and see where we ended up. And this is always interesting to go back to these sorts of moments here on stage. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your stories from the, from the Nordic success stories. And uh, thank you so much for the audience. And let's have a great slush. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.